Hi, this is the first lecture of the first unit in this course of Natural Resources and International Security in Latin America. The goal of this unit is to review in a, in a short period of two weeks 200 years of Latin American history. This is not, we are not aiming at being proficient on the history of Latin America, but what we want is to highlight two main aspects. First, the role of natural resources shaping the history and even the institutional building uh, of Latin America that we will see how important it has been in the entire history. And on the other hand, to give you, for the ones that are not informed with the, with the recent history of Latin America, to give you reference of what is going on, so you can you can frame the discussion at a at the larger picture. Uh, what we will do is not to repeat the book of Howard and Klein, but uh, but the opposite. We w what we will do is to use a chronological approach. Uh, to these two hundreds of history that we want to cover, so that we that will give you that will be a, as we think a complement to the topic based approach of the book. So the book is more about what happened to social class, what happened to institutions, what happened to democracy, and what we will try to order that in a chronological term uh, uh, approach and also to give a more the economic structure of the processes that will that I think both nicely fit. Uh, I have to apologize in advance for the blunt generalization that we will commit in these two weeks, but it's the only way that we, we can do it the way we, we want it. Um, so we will have four lectures these two weeks, short lectures. The first one is how we enter into modernity, the one that we will approach today. And next week we will have three short lectures on how it changed the model in the 1920s and 30s for more an, from an export-led model to more an inward-led uh, model, the role of industrialization, political instability, populism, dictatorships, uh, then we will see the dual transition to democracy and neoliberalism that happened at the same time in the 80s that shaped our current times. And finally, the decline of the neoliberal regime and the emergence of new regimes, the emergence of some people call it populist, some other people more progressive, more uh, left-wing oriented, we still really don't know what is going on, but something different that, with, that has a different approach to politics and even to the topic of our interest, to the management of natural resources uh, and the kind of conflicts that, that emerge. So I'd like to start with, okay, why Latin America, well, what is Latin America? Well, Latin America, uh, doesn't even have a geographical entity. Um, most Latin Americans uh, doesn't have anything in common. Uh, we have we speak different languages. Uh, you have Mexico doesn't have a lot to do with Chile. Argentina has certainly nothing to do with El Salvador or Paraguay with Peru or Colombia. Different trajectories, different uh, societies different economic activities. Uh, so what we say is uh, there has there is a stretch of concept of Latin America as a as an entity, as a thing, and as a region. What we call so it's good to know what what we think when we talk about Latin Latin America. Uh, well basically what we start to talk about Latin America in the 19th century when the opening of the world trade and the supply of natural resources coming from Latin America to the in industrialization process 
that was uh, going on in the North Atlantic uh, countries, they give the feeling of some unity. But mainly, most of the countries after independence, uh, they were connected to to the, 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 the main economic countries independently. So there was not all the inter interregional exchanges and migration of that stopped in in the in the nineteenth century. Anyway, when we talk about Latin America is that we call about the independent countries that are below the Rio Grande. Uh, we talk about Latin America of the countries that have a colonial past from Spain and Portugal in the Americas, you know, the difference of the Anglo Saxon and of the of in, in the US and Canada. Uh, a similar development path in the 19th century and most of them, not all of them, not Cuba, not Brazil, uh, roughly gain independence in the 1920s. So I'm sorry this, I, I have a couple of slides in Spanish, I hope you understand, I, I, but I, I'll tell you what, what it says in, in case you, you don't understand. But the idea, this slide shows, okay, what, what, what happened to Latin America in the, in the long run uh, until the 19th century, until basically the 20th century, there was not such a gap, economic gap between uh, Western Europe, the US, uh, and Latin America, and things changed. So we lost the path of development once the, what we call the developed uh, world uh, took off in the in the 20th century, century, Latin America stagnated. What we see in the yellow line, orange line, actually, is the the gap. How many times is the is the right axis? How many times is the the in, the income difference between the U.S. and Latin America? So it was pretty similar in the 16th, 17th century, and in the 19th century, it was a two, when the U.S. took off. Uh, stayed for stagnated for a century that gap and then increase again with the decay. This is very important so you can understand in the la longue durée as the French say uh, was the place of Latin America in the world. This is the evolution of the GDP per capita of Latin America. As you see the the well what, 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 what you see is the, the, the interregional differences uh, of this axis, so how that, that increases. And basically what happened is that Latin America basically didn't manage to, to catch up. Japan did, Europe did, uh, certainly uh, Africa is worse off. So Latin America has uh, an interesting peculiarity. One is one of the regions in which democracy has been established. Even at the beginning of the 20th century, was one. I mean, there were not many democratic countries, and many countries in Latin America uh, were at the cutting edge of liberal democracy. Now, then we had uh, political instability, dictatorships, and all of that, but mainly after, and then we managed to recover that in the 1980s. Uh, so, and currently there are not many regions when fairly stable democracies. Uh, you have Europe, you have North America, and then isolated parts in Oceania, a couple of countries in, in Africa, Asia, but not many, where you have all of the countries in Latin America uh, as democracies, with the exception, of course, of of Cuba. Uh, so this is the role of, of Latin America is important, but on the other hand, it's the only place where you have such levels of poverty and the levels of inequality. So in this sense, it's pretty unique. And what you had in the early 20th century, the the emergence of of uh, liberal democracies 
the kind of the the in, in, in a sense Latin America was an outlier. Because in Europe and in the US you have grown middle classes that were struggling for more rights, for an opening of the regimes and increasing social rights. And that didn't happen in Latin America. And that has to do with the peculiarity of what we what the idea of this couple of lectures to tell you, to address the peculiarities of Latin America. For example, the trust in institutions, what we have, one of the peculiarities that we have with this, with our democracies, is that the, the private institutions, as you will see in the right table, uh, the church, radio, TV, big companies, banks, uh, they have more uh, trust, people have more trust in those private institutions than in democratic institutions. Political parties that are supposed to have the monopoly of representation in liberal democracies rank at the lowest. So this is very important to understand what the, what is going on in, in Latin America. And we think that has long-term roots that we will address. Same with income distribution the highest income distribution in the world. So, and even after 200 years of independence, uh, still Latin America, as you will see on the left, we still rely on the export of material. The f very foundation of the modern states, and we will see in a couple of minutes, comes from the export of natural resources by current times that still holds true. On the right uh, figure, what you can see is that you have a, a, an important heterogeneity within the region. It's not the same that Brazil, uh, where here, Brazil or Mexico, Mexico basically after NAFTA, that rely every time less on export of natural resources, Brazil with an important industrialization state since the 1970s, but still Brazil that we, we think that is an industrial country, 60 more than 60% of their exports today are natural resources. And this idea of El Dorado in which the, the natural wealth in, in which the, the region is endowed doesn't come true. It never comes true. So. Why is that? What 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 is the problem that with Latin American development we we've, we've had several uh, kind of explanation that the literature have already taken one of the, the kind of of colonialists that we had that we had lat, uh, a Latin from Southern Europe that is more extractive culture rather than the Anglo-Saxon that went to the U.S. and and Canada to develop uh, the, the, the resources of the Iberian legacy that we had in Latin America. Uh, also anthropological, the, there has been a lot of races, the, the kind of people that, that inhabit the, each region. Also uh, the kind of dependent development that, that we had that the export of natural resources in, in terms of like, for example, you know, the Economic Commission for Latin America, CEPAL in Spanish, the, the theory of economic development, so the, the long-term uh, decay in terms of trade of what we have to offer to our world have been declining while what the, the developed countries have to offer has increased. Uh, well, I, I will try to give you a more an approach of coming from political economy that in a way it depends on the structural factors that we have the, the for example natural resources the kind of population but also the institutions that we have the way power is distributed how all of these shapes the kind of institutions and the kind of economy that we develop we'll start with how we enter um, modernity 
so in the in the 1920s as i said we've had the independence processes that was very heterogeneous but basically in general that was a mess most of countries struggled for half a century in order to gain a full control of the territory to build a national army to build institutions that will uh, be able to manage a, a new uh, capitalist economy so what i what i will address is the differences between countries that as i said are the the, the, the path has been pretty heterogeneous will depend on the commodity lottery that i will explain in a second and the political institutional framework the commodity lottery refers to the kind of product that you have as you know latin america is a here is a large con uh, continent where you have different regions different geographies at the bottom of patagonia what you have is cold sparse uh, with oil with uh, ships then you have the pampas uh, but it's completely different to the the jungle in Brazil where you have um, coffee, cacao uh, or the mining that you have in the Andes in Bolivia with silver or gold the guano in, in Peru with the uh, coffee, cocoa, I mean all banana in Central America the fruits all of that, each product has a particular impact on the local economy in, in the way that is different the intensity that you need. For example, in the Pampas in Argentina, the kind of infrastructure that you have, uh, you cannot have, it cannot be extractive industry. Uh, you need, it's a huge land uh, in which you needed to build infrastructure. It was unpopulated, so you needed to bring immigration. You have to have higher salaries to make people stay uh, so that will uh, in order to export you have to industrialize to have the meat packing process so that will have a different impact that for example guano in Peru uh, which was basically to bring uh, to take it to the ships and that was it no connection with the local economy so all of that that's why I call it's not me it's Victor Boomer Thomas called the commodity lottery that depends on on the the the, the natural produce of each country. So what we had at the 1920s it was the the industrial revolution of the North Atlantic, the decay of the Spanish legacy. The UK was pushing for free trade in the world. They had there was the industrial revolution so they were producing in industrial products and they needed raw materials Latin America had all kind of raw material so it was a perfect fit for both and also there was a, a huge amount of uh, available capital so the UK was pushing and supporting Latin American independence but as I mentioned you, it was very difficult depending on the countries. Uh, each country is different. The weight of the, ch the Catholic Church in Mexico or Peru was really heavy, while in Uruguay and Argentina or even Chile, the church, as they were marginal places during the colony, they had the, the, the weight of the church was much lighter so the, the the access to liberal ideas the implementation of liberal institution liberal was much easier the the same with regarding population the the way of native population in guatemala mexico peru colombia was much higher than the the southern cone so that also gives you more access to immigration and also as you needed to attract that immigration you need a higher salary so you can see in the long term the emergence of uh, middle class in the early in the late 19th century and early 20th century while the 
the autonomy of local populations in the Andes was much more limited, and you can see that pass in the in the in the long term. Uh, so as I mentioned, there was a half of century of long impasse. Uh, there was a fall of inter intra regional trade. All the connections that were in the vice royalty of the, the Plata, from Peru to, to Argentina, Mexico, and then the fall of, of the Gran Colombia that they were then Bolivia, uh, Bolivar, Simon Bolivar wanted to build. All of that fragmentation of countries made fall the inter regional trade. Also, all the in internal struggles of who wanted to dominate each country. It was completely different from country to country, but in general, it was very difficult. In some countries, like, like Venezuela, for instance, where you have the Llaneros, the cattle raised from the interior, in the coast you have coconut, um, cacao producers, and then in the other coast, coffee producers. So all of that interregion, who would impose a PAX, uh, a new institution, that was that took several decades. In other countries, it was much easier, as I told you. In Chile, when the elite was regionally based in the Santiago Valley, and so all the the, the struggle, regional struggle, were fairly limited. So very early in the 1830s and 40s, Chile managed to build a national state with uh, fairly liberal institutions. Uh, Brazil in Brazil was a completely different story when they had they were the the crown of Portugal moved to Brazil from from Lisboa to to Brazil and then was was a kingdom for most of the 19th century until they became a republic so all of that and and the the, the struggle in Brazil was within the enormous regions it's a country with a continental size in which po power has been changing, geographically changing. At the beginning, at the, during the colonial period, it was the sugarcane producers in the north, that, that was the Fortaleza, Bahia, that was the development. Then they discover minerals, diamonds in Minas Gerais and Rio de Janeiro, and then the in the in the middle mid nineteenth century it was coffee more middle class in the south more uh, like the pampas of of Argentina so it was more middle class so different kind of development in the same country all of these interregional uh, struggles uh, took place S then with after independence the the state were pretty uh, weak. With a weak fiscal structure, so what what they managed to establish, little by little, was to build up a new economy, a new fiscal structure based on imports. It will, it is much easier to take um, taxes from the port than to your own uh, population, and as most of these countries, I would say all of these countries rely the main activity became at that period to be provide to provide uh, natural resources to the north atlantic economies so it was much easier to consider state fiscal structure uh, around imports not exports because export sector were politically powerful they didn't want to be taxed but most of the economy, a half of the economy, depended on the import. So it was much easier to tax imports. What I want to say is that the fiscal structure of the state is basically the state. And some, some scholars argue that the kind of tax, tax structure that you have is a kind of institutional development you have. Um, Charles Tilly. Barrington Moore and others argued that the, the emergence of liberal democracies in France, the US, the UK was based on, it was a fiscal uh, political challenge in which, in which the, the emerging 
government or state institution wanted to tax the bourgeoisie and the bourgeoisie reacted claiming for rights. So the, the, the birth of modern democracy and the modern state is the, is the ruler aiming at collecting taxes from its population. And in Latin America, I, I'm sorry, and I want to finish the idea. And the idea of that you can, if you need your population to tax them, they can struggle for rights. So that fiscal contract is emergence of the modern state and modern democracy. What happened in Latin America, and this is probably the most important feature of that time, is that the state only taxed imports and not the people. So if that state didn't need it, the population didn't provide it in the early stage the utilities, services and infrastructure needed for long-term development. That's an hypothesis uh, that we can we will discuss over the course. It has a lot to do with natural resources and being exported natural resources. Then there's also the, the militarization uh, that ha gives a legacy to Latin American countries. All of these, we had the, the after independence, the military was more important than the state. So you have these caudillos that took power. So you have this hierarchical and top down uh, approach to politics. So the, the countries that, that benefited the most during that period were non-traditional exports like coffee, meat, guano. That guano was to fertilize the, 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 the every time less productive lands in Europe. Uh, coffee and meat were supplies for the new middle class and the urbanization processes that um, North Atlantic economies were undergoing. Uh, agriculture took more power, took more, was more important because you needed to feed the new industrial class in in England, France, Germany, and also superficial mining. All of that responds to so gives incentive. Coffee is South Brazil, a little bit of Colombia. Meat is basically Argentina. And Uruguay, one is Peru. So these are the places that gain more importance at that period compared to the mining countries that were they were the most important in the previous period. It was Mexico with silver, uh, Peru and and Bolivia basically. So the country were favored by the commodity lobby in the nineteenth century during that period was Chile, Uruguay, Argentina, and Peru. Uh, also the countries that have new new ports, new infrastructure. Argentina, Cuba. Cuba was favored by the, the US that consumed uh, sugarcane. Also the countries that had the monopoly of a product like nitrates or copper in Chile or Peru with one also they, they managed to impose a price. And also the countries that managed to connect this export, the new export economy, to the non-export economy, like in the the case that I mentioned, the meat packing in in Argentina. So there's another process that was going on. By the 1850s, there was an emerging political consensus that so that pacified the, the countries out after all these turmoils of independence periods and intensely worse. So the, the new political elite had a consensus that it was important to integrate the world as exporters of raw material, that they, need, they wanted European immigration, but also it was not completely, completely liberal because there was a lot of conservatism. The church was still important. There was a lot of racism with Darwinism ideas, so the, 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 the 
to be white was development, things that we still suffer nowadays. That was very powerful. Uh, so the widening of societies And again, this process was shaped by the, the, the idea of success, was shaped by the, what you had to offer, by the commodity lottery, what you had to offer to the world. In the case, the most successful country of the 19th century and early 20th century was certainly Argentina. So why was benefited by it? Had, it produced exactly what the world power of that time, England, have needed so and and also with the lack of of local population in commas we also kill our natives uh, in this idea of building the nation state so there was a lot of immigration european immigration that came so the idea of of whitening society plus the export economy gave this idea of a golden age and how things had to be done compared to more indigenous countries that were not as successful. Also political conflict were around uh, the export of raw material. Of, of So what you have it was the, the, the war of Pacific in between uh, Chile against Peru and Bolivia in order to control the northern, the nitrates of the north then the also the, the foreign intervention of Europe uh, when when Latin American country couldn't pay their uh, their debts or the US dollar diplomacy that would get depending on, on the on the benefit that would give to the country. So in by the nineteenth all of that was a long process but the the eighteen to eighteen seventy to the first world war it was a golden time uh, with question mark because you have lights and shades this process so what you had during this period uh, that in where it was established the basic of the export led model countries that were inserted to the world economy as export of raw materials to the industrial revolution in which the UK, US, France and Germany had controlled 60% of the world export and imports and this country, the UK, France and Germany needed food stuff and, and raw materials with growing urbanization uh, and the difference between is the new emerging economy that we will see is the US that was self-sufficient, was large enough and produced the materials not 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 the full stuff that would come from um, the rainforest let's say coffee banana fruits but all the rest that was basically grains and meat and uh, minerals all of that the the, the u.s was self-sufficient it was and and this is very important for the the, the continuity of of the development and trends that will come shortly. So the thing is that this export model in which Latin America managed to grow, but it was with light and shade because uh, it, it had a cyclical uh, pattern of the economy in which you had se several shocks, uh, like the secession war in the US, the France and Prussia wars in the 1870, the stock market crisis in the UK in the in in 1890, so that would hit countries or either to build stocks or to have economic crisis. That there were several crises that were very they made it very unstable, and it hit it less in countries with a more diversified economy, like Argentina at that period and it hit harder in countries where too exposed like Brazil would control 70% of the world market in coffee so a crisis uh, in that market will had really hard in Brazil the same with tin, the same with Ecuador um, so 
the other part of this export line model was what we call order and progress. The, this idea that I already mentioned, these liberal ideas of new institutions that were authoritarian because they needed to build a hierarchical state that was not in place in the early uh, 19th century. So the idea of order was was there, but it was not with liberal institutions like uh, education in some countries. Uh, again, Argentina, Uruguay, Chile were countries that had very early uh, public education for free. Uh, but still, these were stratified societies with underdeveloped economies in the tier of countries. Only were prosperous the, the, the economies, the part of the economy connected to the to the world. Were, so this idea of inequality that we suffer today and uh, all these international development uh, agencies talk about, that was the beginning, The this idea of... Uh, export economy connected to our market with one standard and then the interior of the economies that didn't catch up centralized state with this legacy of militarization and positive but by 1870 of this national state consolidated they were pretty secular with education civil order that, that were taken out of the church um, so what you had is this authoritarian but with some liberal institutions but in the end what you had during that period was increasing life standards higher education levels it was an improvement in general the immigration selective depend only southern country had uh, open immigration other were only selective um, so what you had were more productive factors available where you have investment in transports and so you had expansion of the of the frontier pr production there were uh, lands from the church that were taken so all of this helped to a certain and a particular type of development but there was something going on there so what you can see, the level of alphabetization, they were very heterogeneous. What you have in, by the 1900, you have the highest level in RTT was already 50% of alphabetization, but compared to Brazil was only 35, or even Bolivia only 19, not to mention Haiti with 8%. So what you have this only to, to show you that the kind of immigration that country had in the century that go from 1820 to 1930 uh, in the entire Americas, only to show you that 32 million, around 32 million went to the US, but also 6.5 million. I mean, if you take into account the level the, that was in, in the impact that had in Uruguay and Argentina, uh, only to mention in Montevideo, by 1910, 90% of the population was not born in Montevideo. Similar indexes uh, for Argentina. While in countries that, like, well, Brazil, but were located Brazil was very is very heterogeneous in the south has something similar to Argentina and Brazil but the north uh, it didn't uh, compared to Peru and Mexico that almost compared to, to the population almost nobody went there so that, then you have this kind of uh, in the early process of independence you have the, the, the social structure that we still have in place today so the results of over the period, you had three kinds of development, more or less. The countries that managed to connect the export economy and the non-export economy were the most successful country of the period. That is basically the Southern Cone. The countries that had a successful export economy, but 
not a successful non-export economy like Cuba or Puerto Rico, they were average. And other countries had very mixed ex uh, experiences when they had, not as, as I mentioned, like Brazil, they had some sector where that were successful, others they were not, and didn't manage to connect to the to rest of the economy, they did suffer a lot. By the First World War, you start, we start to experience fractures in this export-led model. Why? Because of the cyclical uh, crisis that we experienced, there were several trends that converged at that period. Um, the cyclical eco uh, economic crisis increased the First World War, then crisis in the 1920s, and then the, it was the end of that model, was the crash, the Great Depression of the 1930s. It's a process between the First World War and the Great Depression in which the world changed. And that world in which Latin America was really pretty much exposed to made it also change. So in this period from the First World War to the 1930 war, you have a transition. Um, so on the one hand is the economic process that, that changed, also the internal complexity within society where you have emerging, emerging middle classes, uh, working classes, uh, unions, uh, you have new infrastructure, you have different fractures within the elites that make the political processes more complex. And also in the international terms, you had uh, a change in the world powers that, that basically means the decline of the stagnation of the UK that have particular uh, features of its economy uh, and the new emerging power that is the US that is completely different. So the kind of how these countries, the Latin American countries, connect to each one of these uh, economies was crucial in this period. So what happened is missing a, an hour. Uh, first, the World War I it was a destruction of the balance of power in which we changed, the, I mean, it was the, the, the implosion of, of Germany, uh, the decay of France, the, so the uh, the emergence of the US, so the, 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 the balance of power in the world changes. There is a fall in of the of world trade in which the Latin American economies had to adapt. For example, the the way uh, ships were not available, uh, insurances were more expensive, so all of that has an enormous impact in the local economies. And thirdly, the one of the features of the export-led model was the gold standard. There was several shocks to the, to the world standard until it falls uh, later. But we see the way we perceive it is that the World War I was the first shock, in, the first important shock to the world of the previous 50 years. Uh, so what you have there were mixed results in Latin America in the terms that the US replaced the UK. What does it mean? First, that the US didn't need, for example, cattle, meat, uh, wheat, that the, the countries that were growing more rapidly had to offer and eat, consume more products from like banana, coffee, that other countries had to do. So the way it shaped, the alliances shaped with the structure of what we had to offer, the natural resources that we had to offer to the world. And also the UK had a more liberal approach to trade, while the US had used trade as foreign policy. We'll see the, the example of the banana republics. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, the instability of the markets, there was an oversupply, 
uh, with the, over the population decay due to the casualty of the war, the, the discovery of industrial substitute, for example, to rubber in the early, in, in the 1910s with the car automotive industry. Uh, there was a boom in Brazil with the rubber. Uh, the, you might know the story of Manaus, the, the, the seat in the middle of the, of the Amazonia that even had the, one of the most important opera houses uh, in the world and in the 1920s Germans discovered the uh, substitute for that and it was the, the decay of, of the city. Uh, then with the war and, and the decay of the, on the shocks of the gold standard was protection in, so all of these are shocks that hit the way Latin American economy is connected to, to the world. Only to give you two examples. One is the trade triangle that Argentina had, the most successful country of that period, in which we, we because I'm Argentine, we imported basically from, from the industrial product from the U.S., but didn't have anything to offer to, to the U.S., while we export to Great Britain. Uh, so in the decay of Great Britain, in which they didn't have much to invest or to, or to buy to us or in less quantities, we had a difficult time adapting to the new world. This also can explain the long-term bad relations that Argentina has had with the, with the U.S can give you from the natural resources, uh, the, the competitive economy that we had with, with the U.S. related to the complementary uh, relationship that we had with Great Britain, uh, the British economy. On the other hand, Brazil was the opposite. Brazil had a lot to offer to, to the U.S. in terms of coffee, in terms of sugar, in terms of minerals that the U.S. didn't have. Uh, so the decay of the of Great Britain didn't affect it. Although, moreover, the complementarity between Brazil and the U.S. managed to establish a longer term and a long term support for Brazil to become the uh, the most important economy and country in 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 the region. So. An important shock that happened was the, as I mentioned, the gold standard system. What happened? It, it basically worked in the way that it means that the money that you have in your country has to be at gold uh, prices. So the gold that you had is the money that you can emit. That was basically, and you had to pay in gold the. Uh, uh, imports and exports. So if you export more, you will have more money and you have more monetary supply within the country that will give you, you could import more, get more fiscal revenues, more in the state will have more to invest in infrastructure and products. So what started to happen with the First World War is that you have less export that will affect for exchange, uh, will affect the money less monetary supply, less import, less fiscal revenue. So it was a pro-cyclical economic structure that will slowly change that we will see in next uh, lecture in the next lecture that changed for the 20th century. Then the so the, the merging of this new uh, of the new superpower that, that is the US he has a different approach. He has more interest in uh, Central America and the Caribbean, and its foreign policy was connected to trade policy, where the U.S. wanted to control the place in which he had economic interest. This table only shows you the U.S. military interventions in these countries in, in a period of only 35 years. So uh, th th that gives you the idea of, you know, the, the, that we see use this banana republic come, come from, from this, basically from the 
United Fruit Company, that was the U.S. company with interest in, in Latin America that wanted to secure uh, to secure the supply without using tools of the free market. In the in, in the case of Costa Rica, as you know, uh, Mr. Keith uh, was the called the king without crown, in which he had interest and managed to got investment in the U.S. in order to build a railway in Costa Rica in the 1870s, where in order to take the banana products to the coast, it was only 40 kilometers in which 5,000 people died in the construction. Uh, he married the, the daughter of the president and got uh, 99 years of concessions in which he controlled by 1930 railway, water, tramway, electricity supply, had uh, over 100 ships. Similar stories in Honduras with uh, Samuel Smoody and, and the case of Guatemala with my, the, there it comes the, the idea of my banana republic that we still use uh, in which the company controlled post office railway utilities uh, so this is the kind of profile that we have it was not only the u.s but they it did happen all over the region the idea to have enclave economies of exporting natural resources gives a particular profile to the to the economy and having enclave, you even had in Argentina, it was the most developed country at that period, but still had the La Forestal. La Forestal was the, 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 in, in Chaco, in Argentina, where you had uh, two, two million uh, hectares of this particular um, tree that was used for the railway. Uh, so the British company had an interest and built uh, uh, its property there, there using as a lawyer the same guy that was senator for the province. So the interest, the political interest was also the private interest of the, of the company. They had their own port, they had the, their own currency, they had their own police in which basically an, its own political and economic enclave within within a country. This gives you the kind of economy that, that enclave economies have and is the main challenge of uh, natural resources that are demanded by the world economy. So what by the early 20th century another feature that we had along with the economic challenges is that we had political challenges to, the, to that order, to the export-led order. There were new actors that emerged. You have new ideas of Latin Americanism in which, in general, before there was forbidden all the idea of positivism, uh, in the whitening of society that decayed and there was a reemergence of to be Latin America and to, to have more nationalist approach then the influence of revolutions, the French Revolution, the, 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 the Parisian Commune, the Russian Revolution, also new labor movements that were emerging with in the production sites and also in the small industrialization that was going on in the urbanization of, of countries. And there was a new middle class and there were fractions in the elite. So all of this, to, with all the heterogeneity that I've been mentioning all over the place, so in, in countries like Uruguay, Argentina, Chile, that more complex society, you will have this kind of opening. Uh, other countries didn't happen, or more limited, like in Brazil, you had independence and you have a very limited uh, republic the Belia Republica, as they call it, or Republic, uh, that started to suffer changes, but it came from the elites. It was the tenentes and the lieutenants that uh, were pushing for an opening of the region. It was not 
was not the middle class that what Brazil didn't really have a middle class. But it's different in Argentina and Uruguay, in which the middle classes struggle for an opening of these old regimes and push for liberal democracy. And you have, by the 1912 in Argentina, uh, free elections. And you have a regime change with election for the first time of the radical party that was more middle class, very unlike what would you find in most modern European uh, countries. So you have that kind of reform with to different extent depending on the country, while in Mexico you had a, a revolution. Uh, it was Mexico is a more complex complex country that was very but it was wealthier during the colonial period with which had a more uh, native population, indigenous population, limited in, in immigration, um, was more based in the extraction of silver, so had a different part of the southern coast. In this country also the church was more important. So all of this gave a, a, a different and very complex uh, a regime type in which Porfirio Diaz, that ruled the country from the mid-1880s uh, to 1910, aimed at implemented this modernization, this order and, and progress uh, with positivist and racist ideas that basically collapsed with the emergence of other regional powers uh, with Carranza and Villa from the northern and even Zapata from the south, a more indigenous approach that uh, fitted uh, a revolution in, in Mexico that gave uh, uh, a completely different approach, but it was also an opening of, of the regime. So all of this process uh, that was very complex, but this is the entering of to modernity, to Latin America, in which this long century that I've summarized in only a few minutes, and I beg you, beg your pardon for this, uh, what you have the institution, the the building of new and modern institutions, uh, and the way they related to the world, in which the the endowments of natural resources played a key role shaping societies and the politics of the countries.